This World AIDS Day, we sat down with Dr. Kathy Kretikos, Howard Brown's Medical Director of Clinical Research and Director of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Kretikos has been treating HIV patients since before HIV even had a name. She has witnessed firsthand the spread of the epidemic, the advancement of medicine to combat it, and is on the forefront of the drive to cure it. In 1995, when Howard Brown started to provide primary care for people living with HIV, Dr. Kretikos was one of three physicians recruited to provide care, and she has continued to work at Howard Brown for 26 years. Throughout her career, she has been devoted to clinical care, research, and advancement of treatment options for people living with HIV and infectious diseases. On this 40th anniversary of the HIV AIDS epidemic, we got to hear from Dr. Kretikos what defines each of the decades in her eyes. In mid-1981, there began a pattern of people suddenly getting sick and dying of pneumonia or rare cancers. Others would disappear from the community. So the 80s, when you think about HIV and AIDS, was really the age of, of really um, uh, eruption of this new disease. Probably around 82, when it really started getting bad in Chicago. Um, you know, it was on the news as the gay cancer. There was a friend of mine whose name was Danny. And Danny and I both were Aretha Franklin fans. And every weekend he would do drag shows at this club. Well, one Saturday I didn't see Danny. And I thought that was very unusual that I didn't see Danny. So I reached out to one of his friends and he hadn't seen Danny either. I went back and asked again, have you seen Danny, right? He said that he did make contact with his family. They told him he was in the hospital, that he could have no visitors. As time went on, we found out that Danny was no longer with us. Around that time, a couple of the bartenders just disappeared from Hunters. It was like it was never spoken about. Like they just were gone. And, um, I remember a couple of the older guys talking about people getting sick, but I didn't really understand it. It went from being very few cases to being um, many, many cases. It just seemed like it went from a very mixed age crowd to a very young crowd, rapidly overnight. So we had people continuing to get sick and die uh, and really not have anything to offer them except trying to put out fires. So you get this complicated infection, we'll treat that. You get another complicated infection, we'll treat that. But nothing to address the underlying problem that was causing this. In the dark ages then was like I'd work with somebody and then they'd die just overnight. And you know, there were people that you knew that were healthy individual and then like a week later looked like a skeleton. And a lot of that was the early drugs, you know. In March of 1987, FDA approved Zyduvidine as the first antiretroviral drug for the treatment of AIDS. AZT, or azetothymidine, was initially developed in the 1960s by the U.S. to thwart cancer. The compound was supposed to insert itself into the DNA of a cancer cell and interrupt its ability to replicate and produce more tumor cells. Even though the drug was known to cause side effects, including severe intestinal problems, damage to the immune system, nausea, vomiting, and headaches, it was deemed relatively safe. So uh, AZT, of course, was the first drug that was developed. and. Uh, as something to give patients, it was really considered a, a tremendous um, opportunity and advancement. But we knew from the start that it was also very toxic. And in the beginning, we gave it to patients every four hours. Uh, so really higher doses than what you know, ultimately was determined was necessary. And um, it was what we call placebo controlled, where one patient would receive like a sugar pill and the other patient would take the actual drug. Um, but we could tell right away as uh, people taking care of the patients who was getting what because we saw changes in their blood work, we saw um, side effects from the medication. So 
it was clear that there was toxicity to this drug, but we also saw a, a response in terms of um, the infection itself. So, of course, it was a double-edged sword. What, what do you do? Do you give patients something that is um, that, that clearly has problems, or do you just leave them alone? And therefore, we tested this on really patients who were who were very um, enthusiastic about taking it, and people who had advanced disease. Um, so. You know, all of the patients that were involved were uh, well aware of the risks and were very enthusiastic, really, really wanted to participate. Not so much for their own benefit, because, you know, half of them wouldn't even get the drug, but because they really felt so strongly about the need to move forward with treatment. And, and we knew if we got something going that we could work on getting a better drug and a less toxic drug and you know we have to start somewhere and and the patients knew this and really wanted to contribute to um, you know science and to finding an answer for people living with HIV.